You're listening to an Anazal Ministries podcast. In the age of ancients, the world was unformed, shrouded by fog, a land of gray crags, arch trees, and everlasting dragons. Perhaps you've seen it, maybe in a dream, a murky, forgotten land, a place where souls may mend your ailing mind. Yes, indeed, it is called Lothric, where the transitory lands of the Lords of Cinder converge. And if any of that sounded familiar to you, it's because you are a fan of the Dark Souls series, and those are the opening lines from 1, 2, and 3 combined. And that's what we're going to be talking about. I don't fully know what he just said, so I'm excited to learn about it with some of you guys. This episode is going to be a little bit for those who are big into the game, a little bit for those who are played the game and aren't really sure what's going on, like me. Um, so hi, everyone. Welcome to Systematic Ecology, episode number 51. We are the Priest of the Geeks. Just means that we like talking about geeky stuff and kind of thinking about it deeper in like a theological or philosophical way. Um, that being said, I think you guys should definitely check out our Patreon page where you can join a D&D session with TJ. Where he'll do more voices like what he opened this with. Maybe he'll do Dark Souls. I don't know how D&D works. We'll see. There is a Dark Souls tabletop. Hey, if enough of y'all sign up and want it, I'm sure he'll do that. I will. I am Joshua Noel. I am a fourth year biblical studies student at North Greenville University, as well as a co-host of the Whole Church podcast. And uh, recently, I've, um, I'm just reading a lot of comics, trying to keep up with a few different series going on with um, the Gwynverse, with Devil's Reign, and uh, I got a Moon Knight one I'm keeping up with as well with the new show coming up. What have you been up to, TJ? Right. Well, I am TJ Blackwell. I am one of the hosts here on Systematic Ecology. I co-host with Josh over on the Whole Church Podcast. And lately, normally I would say Elden Ring. That's still going on. But specifically these past couple of days, I went back and reread Blackest Night and Brightest Day. And now I'm reading Sinestro Core War in preparation for an episode we're doing on here. And man, I really just forgot how good they are. They're fantastic. All three of them. I'm not sure if I believe you forgot. I hear you tell me regularly how good they are. <laughs> well, you know. Yeah. Uh, for those who don't know, those are uh, Green Lantern comics. They're going to be doing a top five Green Lantern moments in an episode coming up. So hang in there for that. But now it is time for today's subject. Where we're going to talk about Elden Ring, Dark Souls, Maybe Bloodborne or something. I don't know. I'm really confused about the universe this game takes place in. I know almost nothing about it. I started playing Dark Souls 2 specifically for this episode because I've been wanting to play for a long time. It's a game I know TJ likes. He's my best friend. I trust what he likes. I started playing it. I'm still really clueless. I beat like the first major boss and got like a giant soul or something. I don't know what's going on. So, uh, hey, TJ, could you <laughs> explain this game to people? So I'm going to have to ask for forgiveness from our, our big Dark Souls fans out there. Uh, I did recommend Josh start on Dark Souls 2. I know if you're familiar with the series, it's probably not your favorite. I want to say uh, you didn't really recommend that I start there. You were like, yeah, you know, you could start wherever. And I was like, what's your favorite one? That's true. Yeah. And then I just, and then you were like, but I don't know if you should start there. And I was like, I'm going to start there. Yeah. And I did. So if, if you're just starting, I think Dark Souls 2 is, if you're starting with it, I think you like it a lot more than if you play one or three than two. But anyway, we're talking about From Software as a whole. Uh, Dark Souls, specifically, Dark Souls 1, 2, and 3 are all set in the same universe. Drunglaic, Lothric, or Dran, whatever you want to call it. The the kind of ongoing theme is that this world keeps having to reboot and you are integral to that each time. It is a hard game and that's why I like it. That's why most people like it. Uh, it's a hard game. The lore is not just there. It doesn't feed it to you. You have to read it for yourself or go on YouTube and watch Vadi Vidya talk about it, which if you really would like to know more, that's where you should go. 
Uh, but real quick, just to cover the other From Software games, uh, Demon Souls, uh, the progenitor to Dark Souls. Fantastic game. Simpler, still hard. Uh, recently got remastered for PS5. Check it out. Uh, not the same universe, though. Before that, they did Kingsfield, which I haven't played, but I've heard good things. They've also done Armored Core, which is absolutely nothing like the rest. So not really relevant in this video podcast, but the other big how ones. Was, how is Bloodborne related? I hear it jumped in with this a lot. Yeah. Bloodborne, Sekiro, and Elden Ring are the other big FromSoft games that are, you know, mechanically similar, except for Sekiro, which is wholly different and just a, a cool ninja samurai action game, more or less, uh, with a deep, complex combat system. And it's just as hard as most of the Dark Souls games. It's fantastic. Check it out if you're not an open world branching story paths guy. It's great. And it's a lot simpler to understand than any of the other From Software games. Bloodborne is the eldritch horror Lovecraftian stepchild of From Software's game catalog. And it is fantastic. Uh, it's gorgeous. It's creepy, spooky, scary skeletons, you know. Uh, it's just so wildly different from the Souls games that a lot of times people will just file it completely separately, but mechanically they are similar. More similar than Sekiro and the others, at least. So, I know people would like to know, so I'm going to rank them for me, my personal enjoyment, all the ones I've played. Number one is Elden Ring. Number two is Bloodborne. Number three is Dark Souls 2. I know. Send me the hate mail. Uh, where are we? Three. Four is Sekiro. Five is Dark Souls 1. Six is Dark Souls 3. I think I hit everything. So Elden Ring is not in the same universe as Dark Souls. It's not a Dark Souls game. Elden Ring is not in the same universe as Dark Souls. I was under the impression that this was just another Dark Souls game. No, it is. It's another From Software game, and it is more so similar story, to Dark Souls than others. But the story is different. You're not doing the same thing. Completely different. Okay, interesting. See, I was under the impression that Dark Souls would help me prepare story-wise for Elden Ring. But Elden Ring, I, just, I don't need to know anything going in. Mm -mm. Okay. But I thought it would help gameplay-wise, mechanics-wise. Probably wise. would. Because the mechanics are very odd to me as someone who hasn't really played these before. And just it takes a lot of getting used to. Also, I play slower the order I get where I'm like, yeah, I'll stop and play for like 10 minutes. Try again in a week. <laughs> that takes a really long time when you're playing a game like this. Mm -hmm. You die a lot, mm -hmm. which is kind of like why people like it, I think. Yeah. yeah. Well, you know, Dark Souls had Dark Souls Prepare to Die Edition, which was not you know, hyperbolic. <laughs> Fun. So why, why do you love Elden Ring so much? And then why do you love Dark Souls? Why do you love these games? All of them. These games, all of them just have such a fantastic core gameplay design to me. It's something I love, uh, you know, complex combat system. It's kind of it's simple to get into and it's not simple to master. And that just as the series progressed, it just got more and more complex, you know, except really, I don't think Dark Souls three was a step forward, maybe a lateral step from Dark Souls two. I love power stancing. Which Dark Souls two introduced and it was even more fleshed out than it is in Elden Ring. Elden Ring simplified it a lot, but I still love power stancing in Elden Ring. So I'll talk about Elden Ring now. Elden Ring is massive. Elden Ring is like a Breath of the Wild sized game. But in a Dark Souls world. And you have a horse. And you can jump. I do like horses. If you play the game. If you haven't played Elden Ring, but you've played the Souls games. 
You are wasting your time by not having it yet. It's incredible. Uh, by the time this goes up, I probably will have platinum to the game already. Uh, really, I could do it in like 10 minutes. I could probably do it during this episode. Uh, I just have to beat the final boss one more time. I'm just, you know, waiting so that I can 1v1 my friends and I wouldn't have to unlock all the areas we'd want to go to again. Uh, so, well, let, let me start with this. I think this will be fun for people. I had some misconceptions going into Dark Souls that I think will probably be pretty humorous to those who have played the game before. I was of the impression that these games were like old PS2, maybe PS1 games um, for some reason, I thought they were like, I have a sword and I'm going to be fighting, you know, dragons and monsters kind of thing. I had absolutely no concept that this was a PS3 or PS4 game that that there's like zombies are the main thing. And I was like, I was just so utterly lost when I started like this was nothing like what I thought it was other than I knew it was hard, which is why I wanted to play it. And it is that it is very hard. Mm hmm. Bosses yeah. take strategy. Yeah. Dark Souls 2 gets a lot of flack for being the most artificially difficult, uh, which when people say that, they just mean, oh, Dark Souls 2 is only hard because there are a lot of enemies. That's still not true. It's still Dark Souls. But they did make it harder by adding a lot of enemies, especially in the Scholar of the First Sin edition, which you are playing, which you should be playing if you bought yeah. it on PlayStation Store. Yeah. But you know, I don't maybe think it's the artificial. most mad so far. Since we're talking about artificial, whatever. One of these times, I'm just like innocently wandering around. I've managed to survive a good bit of time, you know, which is hard when you're first playing a game like this and you're not used to the mechanics. Around the corner into a room, cautiously prepared, you know, have my health and like my little crystals and everything ready. Around the corner, get shot by like 12 ballistas. Hmm. Great time. I know that room. I was very mad. Yeah. <laughs> Livid. Because then even like, for those who don't know, when you die, your essence is left behind. I forget what they call it. So you can go back and like get the, your souls and stuff that you collected back. Problem with that is I can't because if I stand in that spot again, I will be shot by all of the same people again. No, no. So you just need to roll to into around. the room, roll past that spot. Go back really quick, touch the blood stain, and then go around the ballistas, kill those guys. I actually, there was a back entrance. Yeah. I ended up finding. Yeah. So I ended up doing it eventually, but I was still very angry because <laughs> right. I yeah. thought that I just was not going to be able to get that back. Right. That is another part of these games that people think is so, you know, rewarding, fun to play. They punish you for dying. And in Dark Souls 2 specifically, they punish you a lot more than the others because they decided that it would be better if that every time you die, your max health went down a little bit until you your max health is actually about half of your health until That's you only use... a Dark Souls 2 thing. Mm -hmm. Huh? I love that mechanic. Yeah, uh, there are items to get around it. You can use a human effigy to restore your health back to full. And as you your max health gets decreased, you actually see the changes in your character. If you're not wearing armor, you basically turn into beef jerky. <laughs> uh, Dark Souls That's 1 actually funny. did something similar to that, just without the health reduction thing. Yeah. yeah, which kind of to the premise of the Dark Souls game, too, is like you start off your I don't know if they call you a zombie, but you're a zombie. So when you die, you, just, you know, you don't really die. You come back, but right. you come back more damaged and more hollowed is what they call it. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, in Which Dark Souls 2, you the are the bearer about. of the curse. So are you not the bearer of the curse in the other ones? No, uh, you're something different in every one. Uh, in Elden Ring, you're tarnished. In Dark Souls 3, you're the ashen one. Dark Souls 2, you're the bearer of the curse. And in Dark Souls 1, you're... I never remember the one from Dark Souls 2. Hmm. So in Elden Ring, you're the tarnished. So are you... Sort of, it's not the same world you said, but mm -hmm. is it sort of the same premise? Like, are there zombies that you're fighting again? No. Uh, tarnished aren't zombies. And, you know, the same way that the hollows are hollows, tarnished aren't hollows. Uh, 
it is it's a similar concept, but they the tarnished do keep their sense of self, uh, which is a big thing with the hollowizing, hollowization of yeah. hollowing is is the actual word, but of you know NPCs and characters in Dark Souls one, two, three. Uh, where you'll see as you progress their quest lines, they kind of remember less and less about themselves, what they're doing here, things like that. Uh, yeah. For you in Dark Souls 2, the I don't know if you've unlocked her yet, but there's uh, an NPC named Chloan, who is the blacksmith's daughter. And she will move to Majula, and she will not remember that the blacksmith is her father, but the blacksmith yeah. does. And That's it's interesting. Yeah, so sad. So in these games, um, you basically lose your soul mm-hmm. is what's happening. And that's why collecting souls allows you to do different things or whatever. So is memory tied to the idea of the soul in these games? Is that like part of the same thing? Like your essence? Yeah, it's. It's not really that concrete. But it is, you know, the in universe reason for why you don't remember where your character came from. And why you get to create your character is because you don't remember anything before that. So you could have been anything. Yeah. But so memory itself for the player is not really in there. Do souls take play a part in the Elden Ring game? Uh, they're called runes. Uh, great runes. The So basically in Dark Souls 1, 2, and 3, your goal is to find the previous lords of the flame whatever they were called lords of cinder uh, great lords whatever kill them take their souls and you reignite the fire yourself that is your goal in those three games what does reigniting the fire do do i get that soul back that's what reboots the world so these games are deeply cyclical it doesn't matter how well you do the end of your journey is marked in rebooting the world with your life. And there are a couple endings where you don't do that, but then it implies that the universe kind of stops existing. Hmm. Okay. So are you sort of sacrificing yourself mm-hmm. to do that? Yeah. Okay. In Dark Souls 1, you uh, reignite the first flame. Dark Souls 2, uh, you know, I'm actually not going to say that one because I want you to get there, but it's pretty much the same thing. All of our listeners are like screaming spoilers at the at their radios or headphones. Guess what? I can't hear you. You can't spoil it. It'll take me a year to beat this and y'all just have to deal with it. Right. But in Elden Ring, uh, your goal is actually to go and fight the demigods, the sons and daughters of America, who caused the shattering of the Elden Ring. Your goal is to, you know, get the pieces, put it back together, become the new Elden Lord, the protector of the Elden Ring. Hmm. Okay, so wildly different premise. Wildly different. But is it like the color scheme and the fighting style is all pretty much the same. Yeah, yeah. Uh, they, you know, they deepened the already deep, complex combat system with fully customizable weapon arts. If you play Dark Souls 3, special abilities that your weapons can do, uh, those are fully customizable now and not tied to the weapon you're holding, which I love. It's really awesome. Uh, You can put on a, you know, I can carry around two 23-pound swords, but my weapon art lets me dash and disappear for a few seconds. You know, like just dash eight feet to my right, eight feet back, turn invisible. Nice. Yeah. All right. All right. So let, let's uh, let's let's just jump ahead a little bit. If you had to rate Elden Ring zero to ten, how long would it take you to say ten? Just Elden Ring. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Ten. Took you longer than I thought. Yeah. No, it took me ten seconds. So I said ten. <laughs> uh, what about what about the other Dark Souls games? Uh, Dark Souls one, I would give probably a nine. Dark Souls two, nine. And a half. Dark Souls 3, eight and a half. You know, mm. Dark Souls 3 was my least favorite. I just thought it was too easy. I So far, this is my opinion of Dark Souls 2. Mind you, I've only beat like the major first boss or whatever. I, I don't know what I'm doing. And I play like 
15 minutes at a time, a couple times a week. Probably more than 15 minutes. Right. But and just so we're clear, more. when you say first boss, you mean the last giant and the pursuer? I, I beat both of them, and then I'm like part of the way through the next little scene. Got you. And so, then I got part of the way through, and I was like, I want to go back to, is it, is it Midland? What's it What's it called? Majula? Yeah. I decided I wanted to go back there. But then I found a whole new path, and I'm getting killed by something on that path. Mm-hmm. So yeah. for those curious who aren't familiar, Josh has not yet beaten one of the major bosses. Hmm. There are four, and he hasn't seen any of them. Hmm, okay. <laughs> well, now people know where I'm at. Yeah. Uh, so far, I feel like it's a very average game. You know, I like that it's difficult. It's not particularly engaging to me. Like, I'm not like, it doesn't excite me, but it's like, yeah, this is challenging. Gives me something to do for a few minutes at a time. I like it, you know? I'd probably, I don't know, probably six or a seven out of ten yeah, for me. That's one of but, the most insulting things you've ever said. <laughs> but I haven't got through it that much. Like, I feel like I just haven't given it the time to fall in love with it. I don't know. Also, I'm a child. I like bright, colorful things. <laughs> yeah, that's this is the wrong series for bright and colorful. I still like Sekiro it. has uh, its moments. Here, here's my other question. Would you include this if you were rating like your top zombie games? Would you include this as a zombie game? No, no. OK, mm -mm. I was unsure because I was like these. I mean, they're basically zombies. So. Back to the idea of a soul. How would you define a soul as it means in Dark Souls? Like, what is a soul in that game? Uh, a soul is what gives you life. And it is tangible after you are not. Interesting. So the old Greek word for soul, the way I understand it, and the way it was understood for a long time, is uh, that thing that makes you lively, which is why we say music has soul, because it's like lively you know how does that how is that different from what you're saying or is it different uh it's really not it's really not different uh because you see in these games as their souls fade the fire fades uh they lose more and more of themselves you know they become less of who they are until they either turn completely hollow and you know mindless like a zombie or redeem themselves and remember who they were supposed to be and, you know, go out swinging. See, I, f I find I find that. That's just so interesting. So then I wonder, and I know it could just be that games have to do this. You have to have the little collectibles that you collect these things that makes you more powerful or you use it to buy things, whatever. Every game has to have a thing you collect. Is that just, you know, you had to collect something so it's souls or is there some significance to the fact that we're collecting souls in this game? Oh, there's definitely significance. That's the souls are what allow you to, you know, get to Drunglet Castle, relight the kiln of the first flame. It's integral. So you can't make the ultimate sacrifice without collecting souls. Right. There that is, sounded like I was scripting something that I was going to lead into, but I literally didn't know that before. Yeah. There's a there's a door that blocks your progression in Dark Souls 2 specifically that will only open after you collect the four great lord souls or a million regular souls. Fascinating. So whenever I use souls to purchase something, I'm hindering my ability to use them for other things. Well, yes, but not in the way I think you meant to ask. Go on. <laughs> The way you made it sound was like in a currency way. Like when I spend money, that, I'm stopping myself from using money. Yeah, yeah. Is that not what's happening? That's that is what's happening because you don't get those particular souls back, and it is just used as currency in the game. So, is it because is the reason it's currency because the other people I'm exchanging with are also Halloween and they're trying to use these souls to like get their liveliness back? Yes. Okay, but so in this game, then, though, souls aren't necessarily individualized. Like, I could just collect souls and get my liveliness back. It doesn't have to be my soul that I get back. Uh, yeah. Interesting. Pretty much. But your liveliness never really comes back because 
you're the player character. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So how does that how does that line up with your personal beliefs of what a soul is in like real life? Would now be a good time to tell our listeners about our Patreon. <laughs> yes. TJ needed to think, guys. So while he's thinking, be sure to sign up for our Patreon. Patreon.com forward slash systematic ecology. You could sign up. You get some bonus episodes where we talk about our favorite comics of the month, um, some extra stuff about book reviews, and you can join a D&D session with TJ where he has to spend less time thinking because he was comes prepared. I did not warn him that I was going to ask him what he thinks a soul is. TJ, you come up with anything? <laughs> right. So really, in real life, in the real world, I, I think the soul is what gives you life. That, you know, that's more or less the same your soul is what lasts forever. You know, if you devote yourself to God, I feel like the biggest difference that I, I can tell, because, you know, I don't fully know what's going on, but just by questioning you enough, <laughs> I feel like the biggest difference is your soul is individualized to you. You can't just mm-hmm. pick up someone else's soul. You can't ruin yours and be like, all right, well, this soul's going to hell. So let me just grab a new one. Right. I, I will, I'll do OK with that one. Yeah. No, I haven't found a way to do that yet. So, yeah. yeah. As soon as he does, he'll let you guys know. But it will be Patreon exclusive. Yeah, so. it will be. Yeah, the secret <laughs> to immortality when I find it will be Patreon exclusive. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> oh, man. So that being said, what is the significance? I mean, in the game, you already lost your soul. You're trying to get it back. In real life, is it possible to lose that thing that makes you lively? I mean, you can't fully lose your soul, but how do we damage our souls? I mean, what are things that we do that make us lose ourselves? Uh, well, I think. In general, uh, separating yourself from people who love you, uh, splitting yourself off from the world, uh, giving in to your vices, uh, those kind of things that separate us from God will do that to you. But he'll always forgive you. Yeah. Unless I'm thinking, see, I'm thinking of this Halloween process, you know, to get to like the game's language for it, where you're kind of losing yourself. I'm thinking of it in two different ways. I feel like there is the one way where like I lose myself as in I get so wrapped up in work and school or whatever that I forget my family, that I forget the things that I enjoy, like playing video games, you know, whatever. I see that kind of thing happening. That's obviously a very bad thing. That's negative. But there's also like the part of the Bible where it says you have to die to yourself daily to allow God to end, basically. You must die so that he must so that he can live in you. Mm hmm. So I feel like there's this hollowing of yourself in the negative sense of these things that make you who you are, your family, the things you like, all that kind of stuff. But then there's the hollowing in this positive sense where these parts of you that you're slave to, like uh, whether it be drunkenness or um, lying or maybe you're just overly legalistic. You know, maybe you go to church and you're all about the rules. I feel like these things you can hollow yourself of and get more of. The true life source, which, you know, we believe is God. And I feel so I feel like there's also a positive Halloween. Um, just, just out of curiosity, TJ, if someone's not a Christian and they're listening and they have some of these things that are like, you know, holding them back, they feel like drunkenness, that kind of thing. Is there. Would you say there's a way other than allowing God in that they can hollow themselves with the negative parts of themselves? I mean, is that is there another way to do that? You mean. To stop it or? Yeah, to like lose the parts of yourself you don't want. Mm. Well, self-reflection, meditation, you know, reaching out to the people you care about, letting them know they're there to help. Yeah, I, I, I personally, so I believe the human nature always wants to cling to something, right? And I think the only way to lose parts of yourself you don't like is to cling to something new. Um, which is where I think, you know, Jesus and God is a great solution. But I do think there's other ways to lose parts of yourself that you don't like. I don't think there's other ways to God. I don't think there's other ways to heaven. It's not what I'm saying here. I'm just thinking out loud, like from a philosophical standpoint, if there's other ways to hollow yourself of the parts of yourself you don't like, I think there are. But then I think you'll just be attached to something else. And I think that'll probably eventually become unhealthy as well. But maybe not. Yeah. Yeah. I mean there there are a lot of options. Yeah. Yeah. 
But uh, DJ, did you want to? You had a verse you wanted to share, I think. Uh, no, I did want to mention if you head over to Patreon, you can hear me list uh, rank all 220 Soulsborne bosses. Yeah. Are you really going to do that? No. I think you should. I might do top 10. Okay. Top 10. Do it. Maybe top 20. Yeah, you can just text it to me. I'll just put, put it on there. Mm. You guys are, are live hearing administrative work going on. Mm-hmm. All right. Well, Riveting the first that we process. did want to talk about um, is from Ephesians 2, uh, starting in verse 1. I'm just going to read a little bit of this just because I think it's relevant to the soul talk that we were doing. It says, once you were dead because of your disobedience and your many sins, so you sins caused you to lose yourself, to hollow out, um, you used to live in sin. You were hollow, just like the rest of the world, obeying the devil, the commander of the powers of the unseen world. He is the spirit at work in the hearts of those who refuse to obey God. All of us used to live that way. All of us used to be the hollow. Following the passionate desires and inclinations of our sinful nature, by our very nature, we were subject to God's anger, just like everyone else. We were doomed till the ultimate sacrifice was made and the world was reset. God is so rich in mercy that he loved us so much that even though we were dead because of our sins, he gave us life when he raised Christ from the dead, when he reset the world by lighting the big torch, I guess. Yeah. It is only by God's grace that you have been saved for he raised us from the dead along with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms because we are united with Christ Jesus. I have another game related question because of this. Yeah. I actually have another game related phrase. Should I ask first or should you say first? You should ask. When the world is reset, are all of the lost souls and the hollowed people, are they reset or do they vanish? Uh, So they, they don't really do either. Uh, Some of them reincarnate. I probably all of them reincarnate, but we see some of them in the following games, like uh, Sigurd becomes Sigmire or Sigford or something like that. Yeah. See, I ask because in the real life version where Jesus makes the ultimate sacrifice and everything is reset, we live in him now. And one day we will ultimately be in the world reset when there's a new world with him and we will be ourselves and remember ourselves and all of that good stuff. So I just thought it was an interesting comparison. So I wanted to know what the game did with that. Yeah, uh, basically, it's just like a full on reset for the world of Lothric and Orlando. Strongleic, whatever you want to call it. Uh, but yeah, I did realize somehow, only after you read that verse, that uh, in these games you are basically playing as Jesus. <laughs> you are seeing the sins of the world and all their cruelty and then sacrificing yourself so that may they may live on. Yeah. yeah. And the darkness dies with you, I assume. It does for a while. Then it comes back. But it's, you know, it's a cycle. Yeah. So, yeah. But that's so they can release more games and you could be Jesus again. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Christ figure the game. Mm-hmm. Pretty much. Dark Souls yeah. 1, 2, and 3. Check them out. <laughs> nice. Uh, you said you had a phrase you wanted to share there? That was it. That was what I want to talk about. It wasn't really a phrase. <laughs> like an anecdote. Nice. Um, yeah, guys. So I will say, uh, and there are parts of the Bible that say this, that if you cling to him, these other things will fall off. If I had to give you an action, cling to God, you know, get your Bibles, think theologically, connect with other people who care about this stuff. Go to our Facebook page, Priest of the Geek, because you can talk to anybody about anything on there pretty much. Cling to what is good so that you can leave behind, hollow out what is evil. And to flip flop it, cling to what is good in your life. You know, just because you're a Christian doesn't mean you have spent all of your time ministry and can't spend any of your time with your family or can't spend any of your time playing games or reading comics, doing the fun stuff. Cling to what is good. Let go of what is bad. True. Yeah. 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 I mean, I know that make that sound simple. It's not that simple, but you know, pray. And I'd, uh, that's just the way forward. You keep, keep trying to cling to what is good and the bad will let go eventually. Yeah. So, TJ, uh, what do you think would be different as people do that? I mean, it, it'll take time, like we said, but as people cling to what's good, let the bad stuff drop off. How will they see this change in their life? When will they know that that's the bad stuff starting to let go? Yeah, I think it'll just overall be a dramatic 
increase in your quality of life. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, it might take time, you know, you might not notice it tomorrow, but if you think about it, maybe even write down how you're living today and really try this for a month and write down how you feel in a month, I'm willing to bet it'll be better. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Just maybe try and, you know, come up with something that you can cling to. Let us know. Don't let us know. It's up to you. Uh, but, you know, we'd like to hear it. Uh, now it's time to wrap up. So, Joshua, uh, do you have any recommendations? I'm just I'm going to go ahead and recommend the Gwenverse comics. Um, I've only seen, read the first one. I'm waiting for the next one to release on Comixology. I'm not even waiting for it to be free on Comixology. When I can pay that five dollars for it, it is good enough that I'm willing to part with five dollars for these comics. They are amazing. Um, you know, I don't necessarily love the art. I feel like the art's pretty simple, but the story is great. It's a lot of fun. I always love the character of Gwen Stacy, and it's just a lot of interdimensional, different timeline kind of stuff, and just a fun read. So I highly recommend it to everybody. Elden Ring. <laughs> <laughs> That's uh, is that all your recommendations? Yep. Also, uh, read Blackest Night, Brightest Day, and Sinestro Core War. I was really surprised you didn't recommend Elden Ring twice. Well, play it two times. Play it three times so you can get the platinum trophy. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. yeah, if you're playing perfect. on PlayStation. Perfect. Perfect. Well, guys, as always, I'm Joshua Knoll. I've never been anyone else, unfortunately, other than when I play video games. And you can follow me at The Whole Church Podcast, wherever you're listening now, or on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, The Whole Church Podcast, or I think on Twitter, it's whole church or the whole church um you can also go to our website systematicecology.org you can click where it says host go down the drop menu tj and i are on there every episode we've done are on there and the whole church podcast is on there so simple place to find everything we do yeah that's pretty much it next episode we will be talking about the mcu formula with host dan stewart and joe day go to our website in the description to let us know what you've been geeking out on what we should be geeking out on and remember, we are all a chosen people, a geekdom of priests. This was an Anazal Ministries podcast. If you enjoyed this show and would like to learn more about our network, be sure to check out the Anazal Ministries podcast network.